Coming up, the impossible drive. Rocket launches. And then we ask you, where should humanity colonize first? Stay tuned. Tomorrow begins now. And welcome to tomorrow, episode 7.23. Oh my gosh, 23 of these already this year. No. Holy cats. It's not a thing. It is Saturday, August 2nd, 2014. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me, as always, is my beautiful, lovely, wonderful, and talented wife, Carrie Ann Higginbotham, and we'll be your hosts for this epic show this week. Before we get started, I wanted to give a huge thank you to all of the patrons of tomorrow who have helped make this specific episode happen. Now, the people on the screen right now, it, again, notice it keeps getting longer, so thank you, patrons. These are the uh, patrons, what are these? This is the premier level, which have spent $10 or more on this specific episode. And one thing that I've done, probably shouldn't say, but because uh, it might be embarrassing to people. But one thing I've done is I've taken the uh, Patreon gives me a total lifetime membership commitment. Right. And you are now sorted by your lifetime commitment to the show. So uh, the the more you give to the show, the higher up the list you end up being on all the pages. I see. Yeah, I know. Cool, Interesting. huh? Neat, huh? So you can see, you can rank... I don't know. Maybe that, was a, maybe that was a bad idea. Yeah, that was a terrible <laughs> maybe idea. Maybe people are going to be like, screw you, buddy. From <laughs> now on, you're all going to be alphabetical, and you'll just have to guess what your rank is. Or that, too. This is Actually, the Hunger Games. Totally totally open to any ideas. All right, let's go ahead and get some start, Get some started with some space news. Just some started. <laughs> uh, first off, you, you've probably been hearing a bit about this impossible drive, uh, the one that basically breaks the laws of physics. So here's a picture of it. This is essentially a microwave drive. It's a microwave resonant thruster. It's purely electric. Electrical. Now we brought on Vastimir a, a little ways, a little, a little, a little while ago, ago. A couple of uh, and, and that's different in that it, it's electrical propulsion, but it still has propellant. Right. This basically has no propellant, okay. and, and so they're making something out of nothing, and okay. that's the part that we're essentially breaking the laws of phys physics with. Uh -huh. It's now the original drive is the M drive, E M drive, okay. and it was made a while ago, and everyone was like, yeah, 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 that's not a real thing. You can't do that. Right. And it's only recently when NASA, built, and then, by the way, and then um, another independent research firm built one. They're like, yeah, we got thrust. China built one, and they're like, yeah, we got thrust. And it wasn't until recently. So all these other people build these things, and, right. and they're like, oh, no, we're getting output. And everyone's like, no, you're not. And then NASA builds one, and NASA's like, actually, we're getting output, too. And that's when it hit the news. Um, huh. It, interestingly enough, we talked about this a year ago. Check this out. Now, it could still be fake. Well, fake is not the right word. Um, Vaporware? Yeah, sort of thing? could be vaporware, like not really ever going to happen or right. within our lifetime. So don't get all excited saying that this is a, a surefire thing. <laughs> I can see but... the headlines now. China creates ion drive. <laughs> but, you know, right. well, nonetheless. All right. So, yeah, there you go. Wow, so that I was, was so wrong. Sadly, headlines were, NASA says it's a real thing. <laughs> that, was, that was the real headline. NASA says it's a real thing. Um, Here's the thing, though. It, look, we, we want to get excited about it, and I have said for a long time that the most costly thing of rockets today are the fuel. And people think, I have to clarify that, that isn't the pure cost of the fuel. That's actually the least right. expensive part of the rocket. But when you consider what it takes, all of the propellant, the entire rocket is fuel. Right. It's just the teeny tippy top of it that's not, it takes all that propellant. Right. Now, these drives aren't getting you off of Earth, you're not breaking gra Earth's gravity well, so you're gonna still need a uh, combustible engine of sort to get you right. uh, off the planet. But once you're off the planet, you could use a drive like this, like this, like Vastimir, something like that, right. to get you to where you need to go, and you don't have to carry all that fuel up with you, so now you have more potential payload. That's the idea. Couple problems. So, NASA did this experiment, uh, first off, they got, I think it was like 0.01% of the thrust that everyone else was getting. Huh. So, okay. much, much smaller. And they don't even have enough thrust to boost a satellite. Well, you know, if NASA says so, it must be true. Well, kind of. So, <laughs> they don't even have enough, they don't even have enough thrust to boost a satellite. Right. So, that's what, I mean. Right. So, it's. No, I know. It's not getting you anywhere. Uh, the other thing was, um, they had a test article. They had, um, um. 
two test articles, one that was supposed to generate thrust and one that was designed to not generate thrust. Okay. Both generated thrust. So this tells us that there's something flawed with the experiment itself, uh -huh. right? They shouldn't both be generating thrust when one's specifically designed not to. That's a problem. Right. So some of the something's wrong somewhere. Other problem, it was in a vacuum chamber. Okay. At ambient pressure, which means that they put it in the chamber but didn't make it into a vacuum. Why? Not. Right. So it could be interacting with the air particles around it. Okay. Don't know. Point is, we don't have all the data yet. And while I'm hopeful and optimistic that maybe there's something here, because I am a huge advocate for next generation propulsion and right. that we need to get, I mean, electrical propulsion is a thing that makes sense. Right. You, it just, it's what we're going to need if we want to be a long-term spacefaring civilization or something like it. Chemical propulsion, in my humble opinion, is not the long-term solution. Right. Doesn't mean we should wait for electrical propulsion. Let me be clear on that. Chemical propulsion can get we, get us to Mars, get us to Venus, get us to where we need to be. Right. So we shouldn't wait for electrical or something else. Right. We shouldn't wait for warp drive, but that's where we want to be. And I'm not sure this is it. The data is inconclusive in my opinion. So there you go. The magic drive that NASA says is, you know, everyone's calling it the impossible drive may still actually be impossible. Make sense? Yes. <laughs> so really? many things. So many yeah, things. Yeah, no, I mean, yes. I, I just, yeah, I mean, uh, that just sort of sucks in so many different ways. Mm, kind of. I mean, but it's still cool if it works, right? There's a possibility it will actually work. So we'll see. Yeah. I'm, I'm just, I'm holding judgment for a little while yet. Yeah, I think They're, we all are. They only did like eight days worth of tests. There need to be a lot more tests. All right, we spent a lot of time on that. Let's move on. Yeah. Uh, there was a Delta IV launch July 28th at 2328 p.m. Universal Time. Check it out. Six, five, we have ignition of the RS-68 engine. Two, one, we have liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV rocket carrying the Av Space Four mission for the United States Air Force. Now this was in a medium plus 4.2 configuration. That 4.2 means it's a 4 meter fairing with two solid boosters on the side, which you could see on the either side there. Uh, this was uh, the Geosynchronous Space Situational Awareness Program, or GSAP, G-S-S-A-P. And basically that's designed to monitor collision threats and nefarious, I'm air quoting, nefarious activities. Look, sometimes there is a, a good reason to backronym something, man. <laughs> Gis Gisap. Gisap is just that's Gisap. just crap. Yeah, like, it's I'm not sorry. very good. That's just that's not awful. very good. So yeah, uh, so basically it was a military launch, and it's uh, atop of a Delta IV, and it was designed to it's designed to just watch for stuff and make sure that things go okay. And then we're not going to watch the whole launch, but eventually those little boosters on the side would uh, would scroll off and off you go. I mean that could have been G pass, no problem. All right. Up next, July 29th, 2014, at 2347 and 38 seconds, to be precise, coordinated time, we had an Ariane 5 launch. Allumage Vulcan. Allumage des deux EAP et décollage. That thing's pretty fast for how big it is. Oh, yeah. Well, they, that one has some solids on the side as well. So you'll notice that any vehicle that has solid boosters, they just kind of they pop right off the pad. Yeah. As opposed to liquid-only vehicles that just kind of lumber off the pad. And this one had a couple solids strapped to the side. Uh, this was actually the last of Europe's automated transfer freighters, the automated transfer vehicle, uh, carrying food, supplies, experiments, fuel, water, stuff like that for a space station. Uh, and they currently have a six-person crew on the space station. Consider that six people flying overhead in space right now and this is bringing stuff up to them uh, this spacecraft the ATV weighed more than 20 tons at launch and like I said this is actually the last flight of the ATV It's being phased out in favor of US built commercial cargo crafts as well as Japan's H2 transfer vehicle so kind of sad but at the same time cool that commercial crews getting a chance to yeah. send stuff up to the International Space Station and eventually replace well, and replace, not eventually replace, the ATV. And United Launch Alliance kicking some butt. Seriously, two launches, one week. Yeah. They had the Delta IV. Bam, here's an Atlas V launch. Check Three, this out. Three, two, one, <laughs> ignition. 
And we have liftoff, liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket carrying the 7th GPS-2F satellite for the United States Air Force. In all fairness, counting backwards is hard. Um, August 2nd, 2014. <laughs> <laughs> August 2nd, 2014 at 0323 coordinated time. This launch from Space Launch Complex 40 run uh, right, aqua right across the way from their Delta IV. This is the Air Force's 7th Block 2F navigation satellite for the GPS constellation, so GPS 2F7. And it was the second launch just this week for United Launch Alliance. So like I said, they're just they're just kicking butt and taking names, right? Yeah, yeah. Launching, the, launching those things right off the pad. Uh, moving right along, uh, Rosetta is getting closer to its comet. So check this out. Oh man, I should have told you, I'm sorry. I built this over so you could put it over the animated background and it's gonna be really cool and I totally forgot to tell you and that's okay. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that does look way cooler. Uh, doesn't that look way cooler? That looks like it's doing something now. <laughs> I like how we just clicked the button and made that oh, magic that's happen. Oh, awesome. Anyhow, you'll notice this is a higher resolution picture. We talked about the Rosetta yes. Craft a little bit earlier on. This is a high resolution picture because it's only, um, how far away is it now? Well, it, it, it's kind of hard to say where it is exactly now. Uh, let me see if I can find I thought it was a... like 630 some odd miles away is where this picture was yeah, taken. It, it, well, yeah, when this picture was taken, it was, yeah, it was only like three between 3,000 and 8,700 miles, uh, which is 4,828.032 kilometers to oh. 1,000, no, uh, 14,001.29 kilometers. Someone has that in the cheat sheet and the notes. Uh, yeah, because I did not do that. The point math in of my this, head. the point of this particular story is that uh, it's too dark. We thought this was going to be an icy comet. It's too dark for that. So, yeah, ground readings are suggesting that it was too dark and dusty, and it just wasn't reflecting enough sunlight right. for it to for anyone to think that it was actually covered in ice. Uh, spectrometer readings actually confirmed that Friday. Um, the Rosetta's visible infrared thermal imaging spectrometer. I just, I just like saying all those words. Uh, collected the temperature data from July 13th to July 21st as it was closing in, and it realized that the average temperature was roughly negative 70 Celsius, which is a lot warmer than expected if it was covered in ice. That's balmy. really interesting. It's balmy. Is it what is that practically is. balmy, as a matter of fact. No, I mean that's that's really cool, and it's really interesting, and I, I love that. Um, we're just we're taking such an interest in in you know a big rock in the sky. Yeah, actually, we'll continue <laughs> to cover Rosetta as the craft gets closer to this. It just looks cool, right? Let's just go back to that. Boom. Aha. Uh -huh. It just it, it looks cool. I mean that that's an actual picture of a comet flying in space, and that resolution is going to increase as we continue to get closer. Cherimov Jerns. All right, now, Semenko. before we go uh -huh. to break, uh, yeah. the Google Lunar X Prize yes. is winning awards for a thing I didn't even know existed before today. <laughs> I'm a terrible space geek. It's a planetarium show. Here's what happened. Yeah. Uh, we're looking up space news items. We're kind of working on stuff, and you're yeah. playing this video over there, and I'm like, oh, that sounds really cool. What yeah. is that? I was like, it's a trailer for a show and I'm like, for I Google Lunar I want to go see this show. So we started looking into the show. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, Bless, Best Planetarium Choice Award, International Planetarium Society, which apparently is a thing. Yeah, it's uh, also the Producers Award for Full Dome Festival. And it's showing all over the globe. It's, so yeah. I thought this was really cool, and I know it's going to make this Space News segment a little long, and we don't normally roll entire videos, but we're going to anyhow, because I was really interested by this. So uh, before we... We're going to just go from this straight into break. So uh, here's this video, and then when we come back... Uh, uh, our main topic for this next week, so enjoy. If you think only governments have what it takes to go to the moon, think again. 30 private teams from 16 countries competing in the largest incentivized prize competition in history to go back to the moon. A lot of people don't know that there's a new space industry that is developing. Not governments, not space agencies, people like you from all over the world coming together to build rovers, hoppers, landers to go back to the moon for good. Winning the X Prize is just the beginning. For science, the environment, energy, and new industries, even provide a platform to explore other planets. We've found technologies that changes a surface mission from a 12-day expedition to something that could last Earth years. Tim Allen narrates this unique, immersive experience as private teams from all over the world compete to be the first to send a lunar robot to the moon. 
travel across its surface and transmit video and images back to Earth. We're going to capture the moon in a resolution that has never been done before. All to win the biggest competition prize in history. Connection to lander lost. Which team will show us what the future looks like? We still have no status update. Signal acquired. We're down safe and on the moon. <laughs> going back to the moon for good. And welcome back to tomorrow. I'd like to thank all of the patrons who have helped make the main topic of this specific episode happen. These are the people who have contributed at least $5 or more to this specific episode. If you'd like more information on how you can help tomorrow continue to produce shows, you can go over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. We are a crowd-funded show, so all of your uh contributions help. Even a little as one dollar will help us a great deal. All right, so uh, our main topic this week is going to be, uh, I keep saying Venetians, and, and you're, it's, what is it, Dada? It's Venu Venusian. Venusian. It's Venusian habit. I like, see, I'm so used to saying maybe Venusian. Maybe it should be like a Venetian. Venusian habitats. Venusian? The concept Venusian. is, we were talking with Dave Mastin last week, and uh, we're saying, I accidentally made the mistake of saying, hey, we should go to Venus instead of Mars, and right. Dutta, you said... Why not both? Why not both? Which is correct. Dutta's our director, by the way. Uh, which is correct. Why not both? <laughs> this random voice from above. <laughs> Hello. Oh, Hello, Dutta. Uh, so, uh, now the main topic is, okay, so how would Venusian habitats work? Mm -hmm. And what should we do first? So to make this all go, we are also joined by a bunch of our patrons via, or well, not patrons, well, I suppose they're patrons anyhow, but uh, Citizens of Tomorrow hey. via a Google Hangout. So we're trying something somewhat new on this particular show. We have got uh, Badger Legs in there. We've got Jim and Craig. Is that is that still everyone that's joining us via Google? Or did we get anyone else? Is BZ in there yet? I'm going to say no. All right, so uh, anyone on the Google Hangout, feel free to chime in at any time and uh, say, you know, yay, nay, or otherwise. Uh, but basically, the concept is, should we go to Mars or Venus first? And I'm going to throw that over to uh, a Badger, actually, first, if you want, and say, what's your concept? Should we be doing Mars or Venus? I believe we should definitely be doing Mars first. And why? Uh, but we could, we could do Venus at the same time. Uh, Mars is a lot easier, the resources are easier to get at, and we're not doing unproven things. We, we've proven we can do everything, we just need to throw enough money and uh, national resolve at it at this point. But that's hard. this is easier said than done, throwing enough money and national resolve. We can't even get to the moon, let alone Mars or Venus. We can barely get up to the International Space Station that we've flown, so how do we fix the money problem, in your opinion? Well, getting to the moon, uh, <clears throat> that was George Bush's idea, and when uh, Obama took over, he didn't like that idea, so he switched to going into an asteroid. There has to be a national resolve, and you don't get that without a player, a charismatic figure like Elon Musk that, that can uh, rally people around a concept, uh, like Kennedy did after he died. <laughs> Does it have to be a private company like Elon Musk, or do you think it could be anyone? Uh, it helps if it's a private entity, and uh, it, it can be anybody. If we have a popular enough president, if we have uh, enough competition. Say if the Russians are, are saying, well, they're now going to compete with us, the Chinese are offering competition. Uh, if, there's, if there's a reason that rallies enough people behind the cause, ultimately it's uh, American tax dollars that are going to be used, at least if America is going to Mars first. All right, let's slide on over to Jim. Jim's also joining us via the Google Hangout. Uh, Jim, in your opinion, should we be getting to Mars first or Venus first? Uh, 
Mars, most definitely. Just like Elon says, it's a fixer upper planet. Uh, <laughs> unless you want to fix up living in 900 degrees or 9,000, whatever the heck it is on Venus, or living in a cloud like on Star Wars, forget it. And you don't think so? We talked last week about being able to possibly live in, in you know, have floating clouds uh, or floating cloud habitats. You don't think that that would be a viable? Because it, it was I good. I didn't even was... like the cloud station in Star Wars. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let alone. Uh, what Ask somebody who's been on a boat a long time. Sure. They wouldn't mind having a front yard. Think about it. <laughs> All right, Craig, how about you? We'll slide over to you. Mars or Venus first? Uh, definitely Mars. Uh, Venus is a little bit warm to uh, be trying to go uh, habitat, and uh, just think Mars is the place to go first. All right, and... and would you go to Venus at all, or would you just skip it and say, "All right, let's let's move on to Enceladus or some other more slightly more solid place"? Unless you find something of uh, extreme value to uh, or seek out in, on Venus, uh, whether there's some mineral or some alloy or something, I just don't know that there's a value proposition for going to to Venus at this point. Whereas uh, Mars is. Uh, a planet that uh, is more li uh, more habitable or more likely to be able to turn into a habitable planet and uh, think it's just a, a better first choice for us. No, that makes a lot of sense. All right, actually, I'll throw it to you, Dutta, as well in our control room because we have the Dutta cam now. Which would you do first, Mars or Venus? Uh, you know, I think I'd do both and or try to do both. I don't, um, we don't know what we don't know and there's certainly plenty of opportunities to discover all the things that Venus has to offer, all the things that Mars has to offer. Um, it's just a matter of getting the nation and the money together to be able to, to do it and you know go forth and discover what we, what we don't know about everything else yet. All right, so that seems to be a recurring theme, right? Getting the nation and money together. Um, how do we, any, I'll let anyone chime in on this one. How do we do that? Awkward silence. Um, I will say really quickly that uh, the chat room overwhelmingly is uh, for Mars over Venus. Wow. Not necessarily, not necessarily even first at all. Venus is just chat room comments after comment after comments are like Venus is too dangerous. It's four hundred Celsius, uh, oh. ninety well, atmospheres pressure at ground level. Uh, same pressure as a hundred meters underwater. Uh, you're talking about atmospheric super rotation. So living in the clouds is not really a thing. <laughs> um, and it's, it's multiple people. Wait, it's not wait, just wait. like one person okay. saying, absolutely not, absolutely not, absolutely not. Because that was, that was kind of an interesting idea of having these floating cities in the clouds because right. the pressure is about the same as Earth. Right. Um, and the... So when you go down to the surface of Venus, it becomes extremely hostile. Right. Uh, being able to do anything is is very limited. But so all right. So then let's open this up a little bit more over because the chat room seems to be overwhelmingly in favor. Well, of, and not just that, but they're also like moon, moon, do the moon, moon first, moon, moon, moon. All right. Let's open this back up. Let's open the question way up then. Because sure. I was going to make this about Venus. Let's open this up to where should humans go first? Right, so we've already been on the moon, but let's not count that, right? Uh, we did flags and footprints. Where should we, ah, let me reword the question. Okay. Where should humans colonize the solar systems first? Ah, see, in there, you're gonna go right back to moon and Mars, absolutely. Uh, why anyone isn't, interestingly, talking about the moons of Mars, as opposed to just mm. our own moon, is a little bit beyond me. Let's but you know, let's go right ahead. All right, let's throw it back to Google, the Google Hangouts, sure. and see what those guys. Are. I'll actually, I'll throw it to uh, who do we have up right now. There you go. Uh, that's uh, uh, that's Jim, right? <laughs> yes, no, maybe Craig. It's not Badger. That's all right. So, whoever in Google Hangouts wants to answer the question, where should we go first? I think we have to go to the moon first. All right, why? Um, it's it's the closest, it's the easiest. We already know how to do it. Uh, we need to test out the systems that we're going to use later on Mars, and even possibly, uh, I know Carrie Ann was saying, uh, why go to the moons of Mars? Uh, but I think that's a, a natural stepping stone, and we could stage things there. We could, uh, we could hard land, we can get resources there. Uh, we just need to develop the technologies, and the easiest way to do that is uh, Mars. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> the moon first. So the, we have to go there. So the moon Again. becomes a launching platform to the rest of the solar system. 
uh, more like a sandbox or a test bed so we mm. can make sure all of the hardware that we're going to use later on Mars works uh, with you know with a relative degree of certainty we could even use Venus to test uh, things like aero braking or or uh, cloud cities or those kind of things and uh, we haven't even tried balloons on Mars we haven't tried aircraft on Mars there's a lot of things that we could do well actually that brings up another interesting and valid point which is um, air braking will work on Venus and will work less on Mars and it won't work on the moon at all so how much do you think we actually can learn or is each one of these a new learning experience how much can we really learn on the moon uh, did we lose them one person is saying that uh, the moon could essentially act as the gas station on your way out of town. Okay. Right? So um, exactly as Badger Lakes is suggesting that it's a, a decent test bed. It's a, a decent place to, um, to, to do different things and then on your way out to somewhere else. Which I guess is kind of my point about the uh, moons of Mars anyway. Okay. Um, some people are saying that it's easier. Or I'm sorry. That the moons of Mars have very low gra gravity. Problematic for long stays. But it also seems to me that it would be easier to get in and out of than Mars itself. Hmm. But, you know, I, I could be wrong. No, that makes sense, right? You can use it as a uh, kind of transport system up and down. Jim, how about we'll throw it to you. Where, uh, where in the uh, solar system should we go well, first? I have to, to give you a qualification. I'm incredibly old. Not only do I remember the Apollo landing, I remember the Echo 1 satellite. I don't, nice. I don't remember Echo 1. What's Echo 1? Of course you don't remember Echo 1. Your mom probably wasn't born then. <laughs> Uh, that was a gigant. I saw that when I was three or four years old. My dad showed it. They they launched a all, all they could launch. They couldn't launch, put any weight up there, so they took a giant. You know these balloons you get like at the party store. They took they made an aluminized balloon that was like a hundred feet in diameter. It was reflective. All it did was go around the Earth and make this gigantic, bigger than Venus star run screaming across the horizon. <laughs> so that. That, that was one of the very, either the first or second real satellite we launched after I think the vanguards quit blowing up. But, uh, so I remember the moon landings quite vividly. Uh, there's, there's no reason to go back there unless somebody can say, we can definitely do this or that on the moon that would be cool and useful either to get us to Mars or get something useful back to Earth. Just to go down there and walk around and scoop up moon rocks and all that. We've been there, done that, we got the t-shirt. Let's just think bigger. The reason we went to the moon was because President Kennedy said, and I love him for it to this day, we're going to go because it's hard. Well, Mars is even harder, so that's a better reason to go there. Uh, sermon over. So skip the moon. We've done the moon. Straight to Mars. Forget, yeah, forget the moon. We already have that T-shirt. Let, <laughs> let Google send a fleet of robots up there and dig holes and say, hey, yep, there's a lot of dirt and rocks here. We sent the postcard back. It said, right. wish you were here. I like all the t-shirts, though. <laughs> all right. Let's move on to Craig. Craig, what do you think? Where in the solar system should we go first? Craig can't hear us. And or we've lost Craig. And or we can't hear Craig. All right. Uh, and then, Dutta, did you answer the question yet either? So I, one of the things that, that strikes me is that there's been a long period of time between when we first landed on the moon and all this resurgence of interest now. I think that that the moon being easy um, might kickstart a new generation of people that want to go and do, um, and then we can proceed to Mars or, or Venus or whatever. But I, you know, I, I don't think it needs to be limited to just one place. But I think doing something, just going and doing something, would kickstart a lot of interest and, and a lot of exploration just to go and do because it was hard. All right, what does the chat room say at this point? Um, you know, it's, it's sort of all over the board. Uh, we're getting a lot of this, that, and the other. Uh, Venus is still harder. Uh, Buzz Aldrin outlines, you know, how to get to Mars. We should be doing moons, Moon, Mars, and beyond. Um, the only other thought that sort of came to me uh, at all, and it's very random and very, very raw, so I apologize for it not being thought out altogether, but what, what would happen? What would the world look like if we said, you know what, China, take the moon. That's cool, no big. Earth, we're gonna, uh, or the US, we're gonna take Mars. Um, Russia, you, Venus is all yours, cool, right? Mm -hmm. We'll just start dividing up the, the rest of the galaxy by countries or by continents. Yeah, that only by... works until there's a massive resource on one of those things that we want, right? 
So all of a sudden, I China suppose, finds a China finds can... oil on the moon, and uh, and it happens to have a a tube that goes back to Earth. Sure, but in, in my Star Trekian universe that I I pretend where sure, the sky sure. is utopian purple, universe, yeah, right. Um, then you know whoever finds whatever it is, and it's really cool. It all gets you know either sent back to Earth or it gets shared amongst everybody. Right, so China's like, hey guys, we figured out this heat problem. It's cool. Venus, gorgeous. Come on over. And we're all like, yeah, no, that's awesome. You know what I'm saying? Like, whatever it is. Um, I also, I suppose I gave the moon to China and I uh, gave Russia. Whatever. You know what I'm you saying? You get the idea. Um, e yeah. Uh, I don't know. It, I, it's an interesting, it's an interesting... So this was a fun experiment Thought. on the show uh, to bring in Google, just regular community members uh, that are all space fans. Thank yes. you, Badgers, uh, Jim, and Craig, uh, as well as Dada, who is our director week after week, for joining us live and giving us your opinions. Uh, let me know what you thought about this. It was a little rough because uh, first time we've ever done it, so I'll openly admit, a little bit rough. Um, we'll find better ways to do that in the future. I mm -hmm. think, uh, yeah, we can totally find a better yeah, way to do that great, in the future. Um, talk. And as somebody else said in that room, you know, really awesome that you have young people and so-called older people uh, who are all passionate about the same kind of thing and we're all united by the same passion and, and that's very very cool absolutely i love that we have people who saw apollo happen mm -hmm. and we have people who weren't even born yet that can only dream of what it was like to be alive when apollo happened mm -hmm. all sitting in the room at the same time all looking at humanity going why aren't we doing this yet and um, I think we are hopefully the people that will help elicit change. You need the people that will do it, obviously. You need the SpaceX, the Master Space Systems. Yeah, yeah. You need the uh, even the Virgin Galactic, the x Core Aerospace, all these guys. Mm -hmm. All of them have a place in the new galactic empire of Earthlings, as it were. And uh, all of them are helping make it happen, so you have to be able to do it. But then you also have to have the will to do it as yeah. well. And hopefully the community of tomorrow is what will supply the will the um, want to go as opposed to just the we can go. Uh, we proved that actually back with the Apollo 11 era, right? Right. We were able to go, but we no longer wanted to go, and so we haven't been back. Right. Well, I'm hoping that now we want to go again. What do you think? Where do you think we should go? What is the first celestial body humans should go to? Not the only, just the first celestial body and why. Leave your comments on Patreon, leave them on YouTube, wherever you want to leave them. We've got a Facebook group, we've got all that fun jazz. Whatever, we monitor all of that, we'll bring it back into the show, and we'll bring it into our comments next week mm -hmm. when we're looking back at this show. Speaking of, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, comments from our last week's show. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Welcome future patrons of Tomorrow. If you're not familiar with who Tomorrow is, we're a live weekly webcast about the cosmos and human exploration of the stars. We'll feature things like rocket launches, we'll have guest interviews, we'll have amazing conversations about the cosmos, and of course an interactive chat room so that you can not only talk with other like-minded cosmic explorers, but also us, the hosts of the show as well. And we're just generally excited about humans exploring space and we're here on patreon as a way to crowdfund the show itself because this isn't something that a normal network would pick up but it is something that a lot of us are really really excited about for those of you not familiar with patreon think of it like a recurring kickstarter a way for you to contribute to the show but on a per episode basis instead of just once you can contribute whatever amount you feel fit for these episodes but once you start hitting that $1 mark, we're gonna start giving rewards back to you. At $1, you'll get your name in the credits. At $5, you'll get your name in the credits. Plus, you're gonna get a exclusive Google Hangout. At $10, you get even more stuff. Contribute what you feel is fair. Now, you know what I said, this is on a per episode basis, and we do have more than one episode per month. So if you wanna make sure that you don't spend too much money per month, you can set an upper level cap. For example, you can contribute $5 per episode, but no more than $25 per month. Or you can contribute $1 per episode, but no more than $10 per month, whatever fits your budget. And if you'd like to see where your crowdfunded contributions are going, check out our goals. We're always getting new equipment, we're trying to do cool new things with social media, we're trying to do some amazing things in this space, and each goal helps us get closer and closer to realizing one of those new things. With the help of you, our patrons, we can make this show truly something special. And let me be the first to welcome you to tomorrow. I don't know who that you have to wait for it to go to black. 
<laughs> you always you dissolve out of it before it's done. And then we have a break point. Bad Dada, bad director. I'd like to thank all of the patrons of tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment work. And there are a lot of them. Here we go. These oh are the boy. patron plus. Oh, look, I added the plus in the graphic this Aww, week. Isn't that nice? That's awesome. These are all the patron plus subscribers. These are people who have contributed at least $3 to this specific episode to make it happen. And the neat thing about the patron plus and all the levels above it, so mm -hmm. patron plus producers and premiere members, yes. is that you will get a uh, After Dark episode as soon as we make it available. You don't have to wait for it. It's awesome. available right after the show. Uh, for everyone else, for example, the patron subscribers, uh, these are people who contributed $1 or more, or anyone else. Uh, so again, a huge thank you to all the patrons of tomorrow. So $1 per episode or more. That's this list. This is just, by the way, $1. Mm -hmm. Everything, I mean, this isn't even or more. This is just, this list is $1. Mm -hmm. uh, so huge thank you to all those patrons and patreon.com slash T-M-R-O for that. Uh, but then about four weeks or so after this episode airs, if, mm -hmm. you, if you're not a patron of tomorrow or you hit the $1 level and you really wanted to see After Dark, fret not, we will make it available to you publicly. Yep, absolutely. So we're trying to make it so that you can view all of our content, but if you're willing to support the program or able to support the program mm -hmm. through Patreon, you get the reward of being able to see it right away. All right, let's go ahead and get nice. started from some comments from last week's show. This one comes from High Powered Plant on YouTube. Planet. Planet. From YouTube. <laughs> so close. So, so close. You know, you know, we had such an epic show last week. I know. It was so amazing with Dave Master. I know. This is just showing where the bar actually is. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> All right. <laughs> High Power Planet from YouTube says, As a longtime viewer of the show with my first comment, I have to say that I wish you had a better $1,000 goal. I rarely watch live, so I'm relegated to YouTube, and I'm not currently a Patreon supporter. However, I also allow the entire ads to play in hopes that you get the maximum possible revenue. I'm not sure, nor do I need to know, what your ad revenue is, but I'd rather keep the YouTube ads and put the revenue to supporting the show. Yeah, so uh, a couple things. Actually, is there one? Yeah, the, yep. the $1,000 goal. Um, we made up the goals. Yes. And I made up goals that I thought you guys would like. Right. I may have misstepped. And maybe you guys don't mind the ads. Or maybe you go, I don't care. I have Ad Blocker Plus and I never see your ads. Right, right. I really don't know. So we've got these Patreon goals and we've already made a few of them. And mm -hmm. we are, we're using the money from these goals mm -hmm. to improve the show. Mm -hmm. uh, once we get this next payment from last month, mm -hmm. we're going to be using that to get a new what's called Casper CG system. Mm -hmm. It's going to be for the video roles. It's also going to allow us to insert uh, social stuff at the bottom of the screen. Right. It's going to be amazing. It takes a little bit of time. So like you have to get to the end of the month and you have to wait more time for the money, then you have to order the equipment. So it's like right. a two month lag. It is but, unfortunately, sorry But guys. you know, it, it helps us, right? We, we've got more cameras, we've got mm -hmm. better audio now. We've been slowly improving the show with new equipment, mm -hmm. new cool stuff, uh, live stream. The and I wanna be very clear that the money does go right back into the show. Uh, you know, any sort of equipment you see is all the money that comes from you guys. Uh, we're not taking any of the Patreon money and buying new shoes for me in any way, shape, or form. Anything along those lines, it all legitimately goes back into the show. Right. So um, we don't know what those goals should be. Or we kind of guessed. And if you guys say, hey, this would be a great goal, I'd love to see that. Um, one of two things, either if it's just a good idea, we'll just do it outside of the goals, right? Yeah. So if we have to throw our own personal money at the show, we've done that for yep. six years now, yeah. we'll, we'll keep doing that. Um, or B, if it does make sense from a Patreon goal, mm -hmm. we'll absolutely tweak the goals to something that you as a community want to see. So yeah. let us know what you want to see and we'll make that happen. Um, yeah, and let me know. So the next one comes from, I have no idea how to pronounce that. This is also from YouTube. Yeah, from YouTube. I believe it's Charf, but I'm not. Charf. I'm not. Gesundheit. Yeah, well, you know, it's not Snarf. Anyway, um, I've been noticing this for a while, and I didn't feel like commenting on it, but now I do. In my humble opinion, you guys are cutting the Chinese and Russian governments way too much slack. There's a very good reason why people distrust them. The U.S. government is no angel, nor are the Brits, but the Chinese and Russians have a long history of ill intentions, and they are very much more aggressive and sinister about them than Western countries and bold very bold it all depends on what I what side of the aisle you sit on man yep right so uh, <laughs> you, you never think that you're the one doing the evil you always think it's the other side that's doing the evil yeah so I, I could flip that exact statement around and say the same thing about the US for or sure. I could say the same thing about it you know the British Empire I right. could say the same thing about anything 
Right? I mean... Somebody commented on this comment basically saying... Kind of agreeing... That's very meta. uh, Basically agreeing for the most part and saying that, you know, but at the same time, they sort of seem... They come off that way mostly because they're not so open about the things that they're doing. Right. And so, you know, nobody really likes to broadcast failure. Nobody, That's because we don't accept failure. Sure. Even in test programs. No, but I mean, even as a human being... You right. don't want to say, hey, here's that one time I tripped up the stairs and broke my nose. Isn't that awesome? Now, inherently, you don't want to do that. Sure. So as a government agency, if you don't have to do it, and you can decide not to, mm-hmm. uh, then don't. <laughs> you know what? That's your prerogative. That's the way you want to run things. Who am I to disagree with that? I might think it's different or I prefer a different way. But, you know, so that might be one of the reasons that they are it coming off as secretive and, and as if they're hiding something. Uh, just because, you know, yes, they might be hiding something, but that doesn't mean they're hiding something. Does that make sense? Right. Absolutely. Uh, or maybe they are. I mean, maybe, maybe, yeah, hell, maybe who they knows, are. But I, I think we could say the same thing about look at look at the U.S. and the uh, uh, NSA and all that fun jazz that's right. going on there. I, I I think we're all equally guilty of the same stuff, just in different ways. Yeah. So uh, I'm not sure. Um, this one comes from King on YouTube. King. Courier? Courier? Uh, yeah, Courier? I'm not really sure. Uh, it says, I miss the Space Vidcast launch shows you used to do prior to your move from Minnesota to California. The shuttle launches were especially cool, including your live interviews from KSC when you did one of them. If you could do more shows like that, it would be amazing. So KSC being in, be in the Kennedy Space Center. Yes. Uh, the reason we don't do that is because the space shuttle is retired. And there's not... Full- <laughs> well, it is. <laughs> back, no, in the, back in the day, uh, there was no high-definition online coverage right. of space shuttles. You could, in fact, back in the day when we first started, you couldn't even get it in Flash. No, it was Windows Media Player or Real Player, and I looked at that and, and I said, "And it was like this, and it was, it was this, this big. big." I looked at that and I said, "This is terrible. <laughs> you guys are launching this billion-dollar vehicle. What is wrong with you? Why can't yeah. you even get the basics of streaming video right?" So, um, I we thought we could do better, and by the way, for the record, we did. Yeah, we did, uh, and um, that's kind of what you liked and we would fly down to Kennedy Space Center and mm-hmm. we'd do launch coverage of the shuttle we'd bring on guests it was pretty awesome it's pretty epic it was very expensive to do <laughs> uh, very expensive very time consuming to do and um, it just doesn't make sense to do that same really expensive really time consuming coverage for a Delta IV GPS satellite launch when there right. are no humans on board right. that may change in the future when we start flying humans on some of these commercial crew things sure. um, there are actual goals on Patreon for us to go okay well now it does make sense for us to go down and do this show full time but until then it, it really doesn't make sense right. uh, it, it's just it, I mean I appreciate that you missed that you missed it and I'm, I'm we, we miss doing it it to was, be honest it like, was fun it was, was humid fun. but it was oh. fun uh, but and, it was fun. And it would be kind of cool. I've, I've been mentioning for the last few shows, it'd be cool to set up a permanent staging area mm-hmm. over by Space View Park or something like that. We've got giant LED boards. Anyone can come by, do live broadcasts from there. You know, just make it a community experience where you can show up in person for the launch and enjoy the launch. And a lot of people are like are taking that to be a online show. Right. And while... While that would be available, like we could go down and use it, the, the main point isn't an online show. It's for you to show up in person at the launch site and be able to experience a launch live. Yeah. Maybe tweet it, whatever you want to do. And uh, this would wrap actually adding an online component to that does make sense as well. And I'd love to do that as well. But um, it's, it's money. It's purely money, right? Yeah. So Bill Hughesley says. Also from uh, YouTube. YouTube. I think we should set aside science as the focus for our mo- science for our motivation and decision making on where we go to space. What to do has become a much broader question for space travel than just science. I mean, let's face it. Science will happen regardless of where we go and why. Once we have boots on the ground, anywhere there will be science that we couldn't do without them. But scientifically motivated missions don't generate the sustainable routine that feeds an industry. Yes. So yep. <laughs> we need to do science too. Yes. But not everything has to be super science. And a lot of these scientists get into the, I don't understand why we're sending humans out there. I want my robots to do my science for me. Right. And now you've lost all humanity and people stop caring about your stuff. Right. Because you're sending only robots out and they don't really give a flying F about your thing. Right. And I think that's a mistake that's made. That wasn't really his point, but... I think that's a mistake that's commonly made is you need to tie humanity back into these things mm-hmm. so that people understand. Mm-hmm. And um, sending hum- sending humans out just because we can't. Uh, who mentioned it? It, it, it was in it was one of our panelists um, 
earlier was saying, you know, we should do it because it's hard. Right. Chance it would not because it's easy, because it's hard. Absolutely, completely agree. We should do these things because they are hard. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, there you go. And with humans, I don't know if that was really as relevant. We but agree, it was kind though. Of, I mean, that's really kind of, what it comes yeah, to. Yeah, I guess it comes Thank down you, to Bill, we agree. for the lovely comment. We, we agree. agree. Yes. All right. So, Gem twenty two ninety three on slash r slash t m r o. We have our own subreddit. I know. There you go. It says I'm taking their word on the Falcon Nine soft landing, since the footage could have been a leg a legendary rocket firing or a burrito being microwaved. Nevertheless, kudos to the SpaceX team. On another note, I read that SpaceX will not be testing the soft landing principle on upcoming geosynchronous satellite launches since these do not leave enough room for the residual feel. fuel. Are there public estimates on how much fuel it takes for one of these soft landings, maybe as a percentage of fuel required to go up? I thought it'd be interesting given all the talk about the savings of reusability, but these are definitely reduced depending on re-entry fuel costs. He's Thanks. correct. So the AsiaSat 8 and AsiaSat 6 launches that will be happening will not have landing legs on them and they will uh, not be coming back for uh, re-entry as Elon Musk has stated. Uh, and I don't know the numbers, but maybe the community does to figure out you know, what the, how much percentage of fuel it takes to uh, activate reusability yeah. and it sounds like Elon I think actually had said something along the lines of um, if we had Falcon Heavy ready we probably would have put these on a reusable version of Heavy instead mm. so that you could get all the cores back because right. you know if you get all the cores back then your net the costs just plummet right right so that makes makes a ton of sense but here by community if you happen to know or if you can run some numbers that would be an interesting number uh, interesting thing to know. So, Bobbert for him, also on slash r slash tmro, says... Off the top of my head, the idea of a permanent studio, say, at Cape Canaveral, strikes me as both juicy and prohibitively expensive. Impractical, too, as there are now launches from several sites around the country. Unless a reality TV executive drops in with full funding, maybe a short-term solution might be a sizable trailer or well-equipped bus with whatever Wi-Fi, satellite, and other media connectivity. As well as, here we go, lights, cameras, control boards, studio furniture, oh, snacks, and deodorant too. Oh, so much deodorant in Florida. Oh my so gosh. Much it's deodorant. so hot there. Yeah, so that's <laughs> not an invalid statement. The thing is that Delta IV, Atlas V, Falcon, mm -hmm. Falcon Heavy will all be launching from Cape Canaveral. That really leaves a smattering of launches in Vandenberg, which very rarely happen. Well, Vandenberg, Wallops, you've got a couple things going on. You got Wallops, there. but you could probably roll up to Wallops. Um, and the neat thing is, if you're at the Kennedy Space Center site and you can tap into their kind of their press area, mm -hmm. you might be able to route from Wallops down to KSC and then into your gear without even having to go to Wallops. Right. right. Same thing with Vandenberg, although a little bit more complicated. The ones that leaves out, of course, Ariane Space, sure. so uh, the Roscosmos mm -hmm. and JAXA launches and ISRO launches. Right. Those are, uh, you know, nowhere near that and you know, whatever. Um, I would say that we have a studio, and if you decide to build it right, you don't have to spend millions and millions of dollars on a studio. You just have to know how to build a st studio inexpensively, which I think we've fairly mastered fairly well. Now, inexpensively is still tens of thousands of dollars <laughs> for a proper studio, but yeah. I, I think I think you could do it. Um, so I think it's possible. Uh, it doesn't have to be, but again, my space doesn't have to be a studio space. I right. want this to be a viewing spot right. for people to get excited about launches again. And it feels like Kennedy Space Center, that's where these launches happen for the yeah. most part. A majority of launches happen. In fact, when we were watching this, two of the three launches mm -hmm. happened at Kennedy Space Center. Oh, there you go. Right? So two thirds of just the launches this week this last week were Kennedy Space Center. Awesome. That's what makes sense to me. Now, if, if this grows and becomes a big thing, mm -hmm. then why wouldn't you expand to Ariane Space? Right. Or, in a, you know, somewhere out there, as close as you can get, because they're like in the middle Franchise of Franchise out. They're in the middle of the freaking rainforest. Um, <laughs> Same in Russia, they're in the middle of no. I mean, these things are really in the middle of nowhere, right? right? At KSC, you can get about, uh, uh, public can get about 10 miles away. Right. There, you're like 100 something. I don't know. Right, Anyhow. right. No, so, yeah. That's funny. I mean, not an invalid no. comment, but no. if you're totally right. It, it comes down to money, right? So if, we, if there's enough money and there's enough support behind it and it's something that people want, then we'll find a way to make it happen. Uh, this one comes from, uh, this is our final comment. This one comes from Patreon. James Moore says, I can sum up the interview with Dave in six words. Everything is awesome. Spaceship, spaceship, spaceship. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Everything is awesome. <laughs> Everything is great when you're working in teams. 
Something like that? Something like that. Uh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> or when you're in love. I'd like to shoot when you're in love. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching this week. Uh, leave your comments on YouTube, Reddit, uh, Reddit slash r slash tmro. There's some fantastic conversations going on yes. over there. Uh, that's, that's really starting to take off. So thank you, everyone, for making that happen. Uh, oh, and actually, a quick question. Uh, Chris, one of uh, our subreddit uh, admins, mm -hmm. asked, if you're a patron subscriber, would you like special flair on the subreddit? <gasps> And then if you get the flare, would you like your level of, of membership up on that flare? Right? Is that a thing you want or do you want to keep that a secret? What, what, what do you think? So leave, leave your comment somewhere, preferably Reddit, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, so, uh, for joining us, and we will see you next week.